Today I just want to tell you a little bit about that organisation and that treaty, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and the organisation for its implementation. But let me take you through a bit of a journey, the history of nuclear testing. The history of nuclear testing is quite dramatic, is that from 1945 through to the present day, well actually take it through to uh, 1996 when the CTBTO was, uh, CTBT was open for signature, there was over 2,000 nuclear explosions. Over 2,000 tests and you can see where the dominant uh, numbers of tests took place you know, with the, with the arms race that was going on between the US and Russia. The amazing thing though is that that's a lot of tests and that's a lot of damage to the environment and to, to human health. That's a lot of development of nuclear weapons capability. And some people say because the CTBT has not yet entered into force that it's a failure of a treaty. Well, I beg to differ. I beg to differ, and the reason I beg to differ is here is the date, 1996, when the treaty was open for signature. And if you look before that, over 2,000 tests. Over 2,000 tests. And after that, it's a little bit tricky to work out what is a test, you know, versus numbers of explosions, etc. But let me just say, less than one dozen tests since the treaty was open for signature. I gotta say colleagues, that looks like a graph of success to me. This millennium, the test by one country alone, North Korea. This has changed the path of testing because there's now an internationally accepted moratorium against testing that if any country chooses to test, then it will be known by all. And I'll explain how that works because our system of verification provides that information to all. And that has a huge norming effect, even though the treaty is not entered into force. So you're with me? Instead of people saying, 25 years on, Rob, and it's not entered into force, and I can't see how it's going to happen anytime soon. This is such a failure. I said, I don't want to hear it. I'll tell you the story about the impact. And I'll tell you a story about a global norm that is so strong that hardly a country would dare break it. That's success. And that is preparing for a future where non-proliferation remains strong and disarmament could even happen. We cannot get there without a verifiable test ban um, treaty in place. So that's the picture on the background of testing. Let me now give you a little bit more of a broad overview of the non-proliferation architecture. Um, and this is uh, the timeline that I was thinking about because in 1945, when those bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was a poignant time. No sooner had the dust started to settle and the devastation was apparent to all and nearly 200,000 people had or would lead to losing their lives, then the international community was galvanized to find a way that this would never happen again. The international community. So even those possessors at that time were galvanized to find a way that this would never happen again. Now it's not easy because you need to have some strategic stability as you move forward. And so right in 1954, the Indian Prime Minister, mind you, put out this proposal that there should be a standstill um, agreement, you know, to stop any further development. Not a lot of people know about that. Now it never came quite into play, but there was a recognition by India that we need to see a stop to this. So this is not about possessors alone, this is about countries that care for planet Earth and humanity. So that never quite happened. 
But then a key event, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you had people in two countries hovering over their metaphorical or their physical buttons. And I heard an, a live interview between two guys that were in the strategic force command of both countries. And they were saying what it was like for them. And both of them did not want to get that command. Both of them just did not want to have to follow through in this way. And yet both of them thought at various points, I'm going to have to. But fortunately, in 1962, it didn't happen. One of the consequences was then in 1963, the partial test ban treaty then came into being. Partial because it didn't have a comprehensive ban, either in environments where the explosions could take place, um, you know, all the types of uh, things that could occur, but at least that was a step forward. That was something that could be agreed between nations in 63. The reason I point this out is there are things that can come out of a crisis which galvanised the international community to do something which might otherwise not be possible. Piece of the framework is the non-proliferation treaty when it comes to nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. The non-proliferation treaty is that overarching piece of legal architecture. And then sitting under that is the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, various uh, nuclear free zone treaties, nuclear security treaties and a whole host of others but it sits under the umbrella of the NPT. The CTBT, well actually a test ban, is referenced in the NPT. It's a commitment in the NPT. In fact, I like to call it, the NPT aspires for a comprehensive test ban. The states in the NPT and beyond, then through the Conference on Disarmament, finally negotiated and opened the CTPT for signature. It was fulfilling the aspirations of the NPT. So where the NPT aspires, the CTBT delivers. That is not meant to be a negative statement about the NPT. It's just a statement that it aspires. It did not have the architecture for verification while the CTBT does. Now for some of you that are into the global arrangements, you might, might be aware of the TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This is a recently concluded treaty, a treaty that no nuclear possessor state is a party to and is probably ever likely to be a party to. But the TPNW also aspires to a test ban uh, being in place that's verifiable. And as the NPT aspires and the CTBT delivers, the same is true with the TPNW when it comes to a test ban. We will deliver for that too. Okay, so that's the broad sweep. The NPT has three main pillars in it. A commitment to not proliferate for states that do not have nuclear weapons. Well, actually any state, whether they have or don't have nuclear weapons, is not to proliferate. For those that do possess nuclear weapons, the five that are recognised under this treaty as, as, as having nuclear weapons to disarm. And thirdly, and importantly, particularly for a place like Anstow, the peaceful use of nuclear energy. So this is what some call the grand bargain, to get all of the states of the world to say, yes, this is a worthwhile treaty. There was a need to bring all three of those elements together. The real pressure point is that the second of those pillars is not moving as fast as almost any state would want. And some states feel that they've been cheated and um, done in by the treaty because the disarmament piece is not being fulfilled. I'm glad that the peaceful use element is there because that keeps a lot of states you know, together under the NPT and working cooperatively but it's a bit of a shaky partnership, but shaky because there's discontent about achieving disarmament, but strong enough that I can see that it will persist because it is the framework which allows peaceful use of nuclear energy to be made available. But as I said, um, when the 
the, the treaty contains language about a test ban and then when the 1995 review conference took place which agreed to an indefinite extend, extension of the treaty a part of the agreement was to proceed as quickly as possible for the negotiation of a CTPT and that has taken place. So, the CTBT in a little more detail, and I don't want to spend too much time because I'm really happy that we get into some questions and answers. So the CTBT in 1996, at the action of Australia, uh, the CTBT, the text was taken to New York and was the subject then of a resolution in the General Assembly, which then allowed the text to be open for signature 25 years ago last September. So we're in the 25th anniversary year of this treaty at the moment. The treaty calls for a comprehensive ban on testing. It doesn't matter where, whether it's in the ocean, in the atmosphere, underground, uh, space, anywhere, um, it's a comprehensive ban against nuclear explosions. So it's not just testing, but it's actually any nuclear explosion. Um, so it's comprehensive in nature. Its strength and its enduring power is that it has got a very rigorous verification regime, which I will tell you about in the moment. The thing I really like is that the role of my organisation is, even before entry into force, is to set that verification regime up so it works for entry into force. So states cannot argue and do not argue about that important role of my organisation. That is what we're there for. And so it fills the gaps of various other arrangements that have been in place. So effective non-proliferation and disarmament, whether it's vertical or horizontal proliferation, does require a verifiable and, uh, and powerful uh, ban against testing. You know, if you can put that in place, yes, I know some say you can do simulations, but there's a real limit to what you can do with simulation. A state that does not have a nuclear weapon capability cannot, I say cannot, develop a nuclear weapon capability that they would ever be confident enough to use in, war, in battle by simulation alone. It is inconceivable. And even for those states that possess nuclear weapons, if they want to develop whole new classes of nuclear weapons, then they also will struggle to do that by simulation alone, a whole new class. They could do enhancements of a type, they could do various other stewardship tests and for safety and, and security and things like that by simulation, but whole new classes, no. So this is a really valuable add. It is a, a first step, but an essential step to ever getting to a world without nuclear weapons because it's a confidence building aspect that as states with weapons choose to you know, reduce their arsenals and even approach zero, they want to know that nobody is cheating. They will be more concerned to make sure this thing works than even the states that don't have nuclear weapons. So we're in a good place. 185 states have signed. I'll give you an update on that in a moment. 170 have ratified, so it's almost universal. 196 is the number that uh, would be absolutely universal and we have a moratorium that uh, countries are, um, are choosing to live by. I'll go into the other details more in a moment. So the objectives as I've referred to them is this ban on explosions anywhere uh, and for all time. It's pretty simple and straightforward, right? The main elements of the treaty, apart from those basic obligations, is setting up the CTBTO and the international monitoring system and the international data centre, the key elements of the verification regime. Most of the treaty is about verification. Most of it is actually based on hard science and really strong technical work to work out how can you put in place a network of stations so that you could know that if anybody tests anywhere at any time that the world would know. It's almost akin to landing a person on the moon. That when it was first thought about, it was not technically possible. But as it was continued to be worked on, technology advanced such that today we actually have the reality of the International Monitoring System, the International Data Centre. So an amazing achievement. 
Um, and details of the verification uh, are in Article 4. So the treaty is approaching universality and the update that uh, I'd like to give you is actually the recent developments and um, we have a, an annex to the treaty which is the states that must ratify the treaty so it can enter into force. There are 44 states in it. it. They were gathered into it because of nuclear capability. Australia is in there because of nuclear capability. That doesn't mean weapons capability, right? It's just nuclear science capability. 44 states and it was agreed, unfortunately, that the treaty could not enter into force until all of them you know, had actually ratified. That is problematic as you'll see in a moment. But what we're seeing at the moment is also a major move amongst those that aren't in NX2 that are yet to ratify. You know, these states of the Gambia, Tuvalu, Dominica um, are moving forward and are ratifying this treaty. And I'll tell you a bit more about the uh, personal story of that in a moment. Back to the 44 in NX2, the ones that must um, you know, ratify so it can enter into force. Three of them have not yet signed, you know, India, Pakistan and DPRK. And five have signed but have not yet ratified. Now, do not get confused. There are nuclear weapon states that have signed and ratified. So you can see that only some of the nuclear weapon states are in this list. So it's not antithetical to a state possessing weapons to actually sign and ratify this treaty. But until there's some balance that takes place, you can imagine there's some balance across these three that they'd like to see some sort of synchronous activity before any one of them would move. There's probably a balance across these two that uh, something to do with synchrony would have to happen there. But it's possible. And there's probably another little balance up here. And balance. Um, you see, it's a tough list, isn't it? It's a tough list. Some say that if this one was to ratify, then it's like a set of dominoes that a bunch of others, in fact, some say all of them, would ratify. That may be true, but I don't buy it. The reason I don't buy it is that I honour and respect every one of these countries as independent countries that determine their own foreign policy that will not be dictated by one country, right? The other reason I don't um, buy the domino theory is that often when it is used, it's by states that are actually saying, oh, I've got no responsibility to do anything. They're the ones that are responsible for everything. And that's not a helpful position either. So I don't buy it, but boy, I'd love to see it happen. Okay? So that's the challenge, but as I said to you before, although the treaty is not entered into force, it actually is very, very powerful already. It's powerful because the verification supports the norm, and if any country chooses to test, you know what happens? They don't break an international law, but they find themselves at the UN Security Council, regardless. So the only difference in that way is whether you broke an international law or not, you'll find yourself in the same place. It works, right? <laughs> I'd love to see it enter into force though. And there, because there are a range of measures which we can use, um, which allow further investigation, but we can only use them after it enters into force. That would be great to have, uh, but is not essential for the peace and security dividend for all mankind. So there are various initiatives to try and move towards entry into force. Um, interesting set that I've got over there on the, uh, your right hand side um, of the screen. Uh, my initiative of the 25th anniversary I'll talk about in just a moment. But we have um, a, the group of eminent persons. These are senior, often heads of government or heads of state or foreign ministers of various countries that are working together to engage with countries at a high level to see the treaty move towards universalization and entry into force. Great to have them on board. We have a regular Article 14 conference uh, every two years to promote entry into force. I must say that um, 
This is the kind of language that people keep using, including um, the current Secretary General of the United Nations, who is passionately committed to this treaty. He also is the depository, so he has some personal skin in the game. These are words that you will never hear me say. I will never say it because we have 25 years of evidence that it actually doesn't work. Is that many ambassadors and states feel that if they say these words that we call upon, you know, all those states that have not yet done so, to do so as soon as possible to ratify, well, what difference does it make? Because they've shown us nothing. I'm going a slightly different path, which I will finish in a moment. So there's ministerial meetings. Uh, the bottom one, we, the CTBT, the CTBTO has a youth group. Believe it or not, we have a youth group. The youth group has about 1,200 members from over 100 countries all around the world. Because the work of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and of disarmament and non-proliferation has to be intergenerational. Because the challenge will be with us forever as a species. And it would not be good if a generation took their eyes off this existential threat to humanity and allowed things to get away. So we need to see new generations that focus on these issues and maintain the verification architecture that sits with the CTBT and some of the other architecture which allows for the peaceful use of nuclear energy. The verification regime, we have uh, 337 facilities to be established all around the world. Over 300 of those have been established, so over 90% is already in place. And we have an international data center where the data is beamed in from all around the world in Vienna, and we then distribute it out to all state signatories to the treaty. So our information is open to all states. It's not like safeguards where it's all highly confidential. It's a completely different model of verification. Now, both work and the safeguards one has to be confidential to work. This one, its power is that it's open you know, so that it's there for all to see. Uh, On-site inspection is uh, you know, uh, a set of inspection activities after it enters into force, the treaty enters into force, we can go into states and to see what actually has happened. So the verification system for technologies, we have 170 locations with seismic sensors, you know, so picking up any vibrations in the earth, 11 with hydroacoustic sensors, so these are listening to sounds in the ocean. This, this is amazing, 170 you need to cover the planet. Um, you know, for seismic vibrations to be able to triangulate and work out where and how big, etc., things, uh, events might have been. You only need 11 of these sensors to be able to identify anywhere in the oceans of the world where something has taken place. So for you with a physics background, you all understand why. Is that the, the better transmissibility of waves in a denser medium such as water versus air and the cleaner signal that you can get at 11. And so this is some of the science that was done before the treaty was actually finalized to work out how many do you need. These ones, these are infrasound sensors, so 60 of those that are, are listening in the atmosphere, that are picking up waves uh, moving through the atmosphere. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And 80, this is a, a, an example of a radionuclide station, so picking up any radioactive materials uh, and noble gases that are in the atmosphere. Let me tell you about this one, though. This is, this is so cool. You would all remember in the middle of January that there was a rather loud bang near Tonga. Okay? A rather loud bang. Now, our stations all around the world are 24-7 recording. And so our 60 infrasound stations listening to any sound in the atmosphere, it's clear from our data that that is actually the loudest noise that has occurred in recorded history. The loudest noise. So it shows the sensitivity of the system when 
down here in Tonga, and we have some stations over on that side of the ball that we call home, and they could hear it. They could hear it. They heard it as it came around the different ways around the planets, right? They heard it with different delays. That is sensitive. The opposites, and like I've just flown from Europe to here, it's a long way still, you know, for those who haven't flown for a while due to COVID, it's no closer, I'm afraid. Um, it's still a long way. It's great living in Europe, everything is closer. <laughs> but that, different story. So they heard it so far away. But what is even more amazing is that many of these stations heard it twice. They heard it twice. And that's because the sound wave that got around to it kept going, captured in the Earth's atmosphere and turned up a second time. Some of those sound waves had traveled 80,000 kilometers and were still detected. Isn't that amazing? You know, this is the confidence we have that we can pick up anything anywhere because that's not loud after it's traveled 80,000 kilometers. But so it's some of these natural events which actually proof the capability and what we can do. Now, I'm not gonna go into this in much detail, but we are allowed under the treaty to use the data, which there are gigabytes of, for other civil and scientific purposes. Uh, and so for each of the different technologies, there's a whole range of different areas where the, the data has been used for other purposes. Now, this network's gonna have to stay in place forever. At the moment, it's a $1 billion asset. And so the business case to support a $1 billion asset forever I think is better if we've got more and more areas of use of that data. Um, so that, and f for these other civil and scientific purposes, not just for the verification of nuclear testing. So, whole range of different things, you know, as a biologist, you know, I, I love some of this stuff of marine mammal studies. A new subspecies of whale was detected in the Indian Ocean based on a different call. Super. In the Indian Ocean also, the pitch of the call of known species of whales is, doesn't, I've, not, I've really got to get back to somebody and find out. I can't remember whether it rose or fell in terms of its pitch. But over time, there's clear evidence that it's changed. But why? Is it stress due to climate warming? Is it stress due to the large number of ocean-going vessels that are plying across? Don't know. But these are unrelated things, but an amazing data set which can be used you know, to ask and answer some of these sorts of questions. Infrasound, you know, always picking up uh, you know, uh, uh, bodies entering the Earth's atmosphere, but then as we said about the uh, volcanic eruption. Uh, radionuclides, uh, data from the CTBT uh, set of stations was very important for the modeling that went on from Fukushima. Uh, at the moment, we're doing a lot of modeling on Ukraine. Um, and looking at which stations would pick anything up. And we're working through three scenarios of concern. You know, if there was a major rupture of a nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Secondly, if a nuclear weapon was used. Thirdly, if a nuclear test was conducted just to confuse everybody and needing to look at how do we respond and, and work with all of those different options. So the system, data from stations all around the world, beam by satellite into Vienna, and then from Vienna, that data then is passed out to all authorized users in all state signatories for the verification purposes. But then we have other civil applications that use the data, uh, other scientific uses. So that's the verification system. It's an amazing technical um, you know, capability. Now, important to be a little parochial, the country with the third largest number of international monitoring system stations is Australia. Partly because we've got some territories down here in Antarctica, we've got some major ocean areas that we've got responsibility for, but for that global coverage being a landmass in the southern hemisphere, well separated from many others, uh, our stations are critical. But Australia has been a strong supporter of the CTBT. 
a strong supporter of the CTBTO and uh, I'm delighted to be the first Australian to head the organisation from anywhere in the Indo-Pacific. So uh, that's great to be there. So just to finish, um, the last thing I want to talk about is my priorities for this 25th anniversary year. The first thing I did when taking office was decide we're not going to have the 25th anniversary day. I need more time. And so I defined it as the 25th anniversary year because I want us to be able to profile and focus on the treaty for a whole year, not just one day and then it's gone. And then I thought about what is the most honouring thing we could do in this 25th anniversary year of the treaty being open for signature. And my view was let's get as many new ratifications of this treaty as we possibly can. Now in recent times, in average years, it's either, it's a bit binary, zero or one, generally. Um, last year two, which is wonderful, but generally zero and one. So with applying a lot of scientific rigour, I came up with I want five plus ratifications in this, the 25th anniversary year. And I established a task force with one simple task, five plus. Go for it and I'm at your disposal to do whatever I can do which is going to help. So we set a task and the year then is from the 24th of September last year to the 24th of September this year, so we're not yet halfway through. But we already have three countries that have signed their instruments of ratification and are about to deposit them in New York. And we have, I think, another three that we're probably going to get by the 24th of September. How great is that? And if you look across two years, because see, ratification can take quite a while in some countries, I think we'll get 10 or so in two years. So the 18 countries that are yet to ratify that are not in Annex 2 could shrink right down to eight. And the kinds of countries left over are going to be countries that don't really have functioning governments like Yemen, South Sudan, and some of these. That then puts the pressure on the eight you know, that must ratify. That's why I love my job, and I'll just stop there. Thank you all very much. <laughs>